Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on National Rural Health Day. I am Bob Jimmick. I'm the director for the Oregon Office of Rural Health, and I want to thank you all for taking your time for being here. So the community conversations that we're doing today are part of our bi-monthly virtual events that bring together rural communities, members throughout Oregon, and our partners to discuss the issues that are facing rural health in our communities. So we're excited to do ours today on National Rural Health Day. I apologize for a little bit of background noise. We're at the State of Reform Conference in downtown Portland today, and we have some folks around us. So I would like to start out by introducing our panelists that are going to talk with us today. We have Michael Baker. Michael is the former director of Jefferson County Public Health. We have Kim Tyree, who is the Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. John Powell, the Chief Medical Officer at Evergreen Medical Medicine in Roseburg. And we have Senator Jeff Merkley, U.S. Senator from the state of Oregon, and also a, uh, uh, grew up in Myrtle Creek and knows rural Oregon very, very well. So I want to thank our panelists for all being here. Quick uh, overview of what we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to ask each of our distinguished uh, guests a couple of questions and have them answer. And then toward the end, we'll get into more of a group conversation and we'll be taking questions from you all as well. So if you want to add those into the chat as we go, that would be great. Um, so I would love to have um, each of our guests. We'll start with Michael. Well, let me start this way. I think the, our guests are very interesting today because we have three important pillars of rural health care with us today. We have Michael, who is in public health. We have Kim and Dr. Powell, who are in clinical and delivery of health care. And we have Senator Merkley, who is in the policy realm that drives the health care and the policy around how we deliver that health care. So I think we're really, really lucky to have the folks that we have with us today. So starting with you, Michael. If you could help me out by telling us, oh, and let me go back one more thing. Sorry, I want to go back to National Rural Health Day and why we celebrate National Rural Health Day, the third Thursday of every November. It's a change for each and every one of us involved in healthcare in our rural communities to celebrate the great work that we do, whether that's public health, delivery, policy, support, whatever it might be, and really share with folks the great things, the high quality, accessible healthcare that we deliver. So today we want to focus on that positive. And so, Michael, as, um, as you think about it, if you could tell us, take a couple minutes and talk about what you would celebrate in rural health care from your angle as a director of public health. And do know, I want to congratulate you. Every year, the Office of Rural Health chooses a Hero of the Year award. And every year on National Health Day, the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health choose one person from every state to be our community, uh, our community heroes. And this year we combine those. And Michael, congratulations! You are Oregon's Rural Hero of the Year award, and you've done a great job over the years. So tell us what you're celebrating and, and how you feel your role is in rural health. Thanks, Bob. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I, I think when I, when I think about National Rural Health Day and kind of what that uh, kind of embodies, um, selfishly, I still look at that with a public health lens. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm so thrilled today that with, with traditional health care and, and health care providers that, that, that public health is included in this conversation. And, and I think we'll see that more uh, change more and more in the future, especially here in Oregon. Uh, we talk about the, uh, the Medicaid 115 waivers and health related social needs and social drivers of health and social determinants of health. And these are these are areas where public health has has been um, kind of the, the, the champion, so to speak, of, of a lot of that work. We are we are a really a great bridge between the community and the provider. Uh, sometimes we're the we're the bridge that keeps people from going to the provider uh, for good reasons because we've been able to keep them healthy uh, and being able to work with them and that way the the providers can really concentrate on those really high high risk high needs high chronic illnesses that we often see in in rural communities. 
So when when I look at today and I look at uh, even the last a couple of, of Oregon Rural Health Conferences, I can see an intentional uh, and, and deliberate uh, effort to make sure that public health is involved in, in those in those conversations because we do walk that that kind of delicate line between providing direct clinical care sometimes, providing health information, but we are also all on that governmental public health side where we can help with policy, we can advocate at the local level for policy change and help make uh, the healthy the, the healthy decision the the right decision, uh, so to speak. So, uh, so that's that's what today is is all about for me. It, it it is National Rural Health Day, and coincidentally, the Monday before Thanksgiving is also National Public Health Thank You Day. So next week we'll be celebrating National Public Health Thank You Day. And so it's, it's a great time of year to be involved in, in public health. Um, and it's a great time in public health in general to be involved in public health because we are working with so many partners uh, in the community and directly with our healthcare providers. Great, thanks, Michael. And we really are in the holiday season, aren't we? <laughs> so, and you know that they say about public health that if you're really, really successful, nobody notices sometimes. And, and I think that's one thing that we have to call out and make sure people know. So, so thank you for that. And congratulations again on your award. Kim, Dr. Powell, can you tell us what you'd be celebrating down in Roseburg and a little bit about what you guys are doing to, to really um, work with rural health in Roseburg? I, I think you're still on mute. Okay. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kim. Kim uh, saves me from looking more incompetent with technology. Uh, so, um, a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, thank you for allowing this forum to occur so we can share some of the exciting things that are happening here in Roseburg and with Evergreen Family Medicine. And I'm very grateful for the Rural Health Clinic program uh, because without it, we would not have been able to. Uh, outreach to our community in the ways that we have over the course of the last decade or so. So what has started with maybe eight to 10 physicians when we started back in 2005 has now grown to 60 uh, providers that have included um, pediatrics, women's health, OBGYN, hospital medicine. Um, we have um, uh, endocrinology, um, we have urgent care services, uh, longitudinal services. We have school outreach programs. We've been able to integrate um, behavioral health within our primary care clinics, which I think is just right where it belongs. Uh, it's critical to be able to serve those folks in crisis at the right time. And sometimes those warm handoffs have just been critical. Um, and so rural health, the rural health uh, designation has allowed us to offer these programs and to really serve our communities uh, so much better. And so we're very grateful for that. Yeah. And so I would say the same thing, you know, we're a small community. Uh, we have a hard time getting specialists locally. We have a, you know, a long wait time for some services. We have elderly population, you know, we have a lot of Medicare, Medicaid patients uh, that should not really be driving up and down the I-5 corridor for services. They uh, should be able to get them locally. So just uh, being able to be creative um, with our rural health designation and bringing things in, we just put in a mammogram here within our women's health clinic so women can come in and do a one-stop shop you cannot believe the number of people, of women locally that have never had a mammogram and they're pushing 70 years old. So, uh, you know, we're finding some stuff. And so we were able to get our community health workers together and start a cancer support group and just to be innovative. So I feel like that is what rural health means to me is just innovating in ways that you can uh, take care of those gaps in care. Excellent. Thanks. It sounds like very exciting stuff going on down there, and, and, and um, it continues to go on down there. Senator Merkley, thank you for joining us. Um, as the third pillar of rural health in our conversation today, from the policy end, how would you celebrate national? How do, do you see us celebrating National Rural Health Day? And what's the role of policy 
um, in the work that we do. Hey, greetings, everyone. First, let me make sure that you all can hear me. A oh, thumbs up. Okay, yep, great. Sounds good. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me to to the town hall today to celebrate National Rural Health Day. Think about how large Oregon is, 96,000 square miles and most of it rural. And each year I go to every county and hold a, a town hall and wherever I go, it's guaranteed that issues regarding healthcare will come up. And we just know that there's not a one size fits all solution when, when it comes to delivering uh, healthcare. And that's why I advocated for the creation of an Office of Rural Healthcare at the Center for Disease Control at, at CDC. And because it's not a partisan issue, I was able to reach across the aisle, recruit the Senator from Mississippi, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith, and we created this office. And part of the th inspiration to me was that during the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, it was so clear that delivering health care is so different in rural Oregon than in a, in a city. And attitudes about health care can be very different. And so it makes it very important that we recognize that and incorporate it into every aspect of our, of our health care policy. Uh, uh, let me touch on a, a couple ways that I, I'm working in the Senate to try to, um, I guess, encapsulate that, that or, or pursue that philosophy. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone can access the care you need. Doesn't matter where you live. So what does that mean? That means we got to keep our rural hospitals and our rural clinics and other services open and available to everyone. And every time a rural clinic or a hospital shuts down, that is an absolute tragedy when it comes to pursuing that business. We have to do everything we can to keep them open. And as Oregon's representative on the committee that funds the federal government, uh, I made sure that last year's spending bill for 2024 included investments like uh, 12 and a half million for the state offices of, of rural health, including the Oregon office of, of rural health. And I advocated for the, the Medicare rural hospital flexibility program. So critical access hospitals in rural areas can keep serving communities. A second main factor is we have to grow our rural workforce and you know, I am very kind of personally connected to the healthcare workforce. My son is a physician's assistant. My wife is a, is a nurse. She's worked in hospitals. She's worked in hospice care. She's right now in training to provide uh, uh, health care to uh, uh, homeless uh, individuals. And so she's been in healthcare from many different perspectives. But we know in rural areas, it's that much harder to recruit doctors and nurses and that rural healthcare workers, whatever stress they're feeling, whatever healthcare workers are feeling and stress in an urban area is just magnified in, in rural areas. Too many hours, too many patients, traveling too many miles. It's a real recipe for burnout. So we have to train and ret retain uh, more nurses because otherwise you end up in this downward cycle where fewer nurses, fewer healthcare workers, more stress, more burnout, and then you have even uh, fewer. And the demographics aren't, aren't helping us out. I mean, here we are looking at the fact that uh, 10,000 Americans a day are hitting 65. So we're an aging population that needs more healthcare. At the same time, we have fewer healthcare workers. So that's the challenge we're, we're, we're facing and why it's so important to train and retain more workers. One thing I did was uh, uh, to get a couple million dollars, $2 million for Umpqua Community College in Roseburg for a medical careers hub and clinic. A number of other previous years, I've been able to get funding to expand nurse training centers at our, at our community colleges. Uh, those are expensive programs to run, but people tend to stay where they're trained. So if our rural community colleges have nurse training programs or, or training programs for other healthcare workers, that really increases the, the local workforce. A third thing is we have to protect maternal care. And what happened in, in Baker City was, was an example of what can't happen. Uh, and Senator Wyden, were just, the two of us were just immersed in trying to create an emergency intervention and keep that from happening to shut down other obstetrics uh, unit. But we weren't able, we weren't able to uh, succeed. And now when winter comes and the road is, it, uh, you know, the highway is in trouble, uh, there's gonna be a lot of, of worried uh, um, 
mothers, uh, well, or near mothers, women about to deliver, uh, hoping to make sure that they can access what they need. So we have to focus on that and prevent that from happening. And another area I'll mention is that we have to do a lot more about opioids and mental and behavioral health. Uh, I used to hear a lot more about mental and behavioral health in the cities, but I'm hearing about it all over Oregon, all over rural Oregon. And so that's extremely important. We were able to secure 145 million for the National Rural Communities Opioid Response Program. Again, what I like is that was for the rural communities opioid response program, not for a generalized program where most of the money might end up in the cities, and also for Behavioral Health Stabilization Center in, in Lane County, and another stabilization center in Mallier County. Uh, so I'm going to keep uh, uh, pursuing those types of um, efforts. Uh, you all, um, please contact my team, Becca on my team, my Healthcare LA, uh, or any of my field reps to, to help guide the things that I should be advocating for to maximize the effectiveness of our, of our partnership and bringing, bringing federal, force, federal resources to bear. So uh, that's my thoughts as we uh, celebrate National Rural Health Day. Thank you, Senator, I appreciate that. Um, I, I just came back from DC last night where I spent a couple days with the um, rural, excuse me, the Rural Policy Research Institute. And the, and the purpose of the meetings was to talk about what a, a comprehensive rural healthcare system would look like if we were to build it from scratch. And of course, a lot of conversation came around what were essential services for something like that. So I wanna look at the three of you, again, from your pillars of public health and clinical and policy on, on the development of a system like that. And so to start with um, Kim and Dr. Paul, if you talk a little bit from a clinical perspective, what you see as essential services, then Michael from a public health and then Senator, how you might see um, sort of the financial or the policy support coming in to help drive that. Yeah, I, I think that number one priority should be access. Uh, just speaking to what Senator Merkley was just referring to, a crisis is uh, obvious once you lose a service. And so there are a lot of metrics to follow, but access should be number one priority. And what do I mean by access? Well, certainly primary care uh, and longitudinal care and urgent care, uh, psych psychiatric uh, care uh, is, is important. Uh, we are seeing a lot of mental health issues in the rural setting, and we're seeing at a younger age. You know, we just met with some HRSA um, representatives a couple of days ago, and they did their own survey and they showed that 25% of adolescents have a mental health diagnosis and nearly 40% have um, some form of symptom, anxiety or depression. And we're seeing that. And so addressing that need is gonna be very, very important. Um, execution of those services. So sometimes you can have all the right people, but you don't have the ancillary services in place to, to make it happen. One of the problems that we see is we can prescribe a medication, but if we don't have a pharmacist to dispense the medications, that breaks down the, the care uh, that we can provide. And we've seen that here locally, a lot of local pharmacies have closed. Um, and so, making sure in our case we'd love to have the ability to have a 340b um, pharmacy within the rural health clinics so we can uh, be creative also a pharmacist to integrate within our clinics that would really be helpful in our care delivery system so i, I guess that's enough probably for me but I, I think access and having those programs that are not just directly related to care but but ex, you know incredibly important to complete the care in place. Yeah, and I think uh, just to build on that, I think being able to address the social determinants has been um, really a challenge. Uh, you know, people needing housing and people needing food. Uh, we're very grateful that the Oregon Health Authority has uh, developed community health workers and peer navigators because that has been game-changing in the way that we are able to help 
these people kind of uh, navigate through the social determinants field and find out what's out there. And I will say, you know, the way we utilize our community health workers is, you know, we just, we give them someone to follow and they just find what they need and get it done. And they're very tenacious about it. Um, so we're, we're grateful for that program, but to bring that all together with their healthcare, where they don't have to worry about all the other things, they can just come in and get everything done uh, in one place is essential because many of them don't have transportation either. So, um, you know, we're, to me, that's the most important piece would be able to get additional uh, funds through the government to do the pharmacy, to allow us to keep growing our mental health department that's integrated in primary care rather than having to send them out because chances are they won't go later. Um, anyway, I think those are the, in, the, important, the important parts of building a true rural health center. Excellent, thank you. And I think that kind of sets us up in a direction, Michael, for you from a from a public health perspective, looking at social determinants and other other areas. Yeah, and I, Bobby, you you said it earlier. When public health does its job, you often don't know it, and you don't you don't even see it. Uh, those social drivers and social determinants of health are are, are a great example. I, I think a, a, a really um, comprehensive rural pub, uh, rural healthcare system. Uh, would also have that emphasis on primary prevention uh, way, way up, upstream uh, to where uh, programs like our, our home visiting programs, our nurse home visiting programs, Healthy Families Oregon program, where we are working with families to give them the skills and resources they need to, to uh, address those right at the time that they're occurring and develop that skill set so they are able to, to, to move on uh, and, and not be uh, in, in those, in those tight, tight situations again. Um, I, I love the I love the discussion about an integrated system. Um, we heard at, at the uh, the Oregon Royal Health Conference how how they, the Yellow Hop tribe and their clinic was built around that whole model. Uh, we tried to copy that in Jefferson County as well, where our FQHC, our our our, our regional hospital and public health are literally and our independent providers are literally on the same campus where where there's no wrong door to, to get access. And if you happen to walk in somewhere and public health isn't where you need to go, we can literally walk you and give you that warm handoff now as, as well. So when, when we talk about a comprehensive system, yes, yes, you know, it, it, it is it's really essential to have that access to 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 the providers. But when you don't have a lot of providers, the best thing you can do is keep people from needing the providers. And so the 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 the, the upstream uh, primary prevention that public health does, uh, in my mind and in, in my advocacy, really needs to be uh, supported more uh, with both resources and, and and funding, and then have that cooperation with the hospitals uh, and and clinics to where we can be that that extra extra support that 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 is needed to to guide some of the clients in the resources uh, that that they do need. Excellent, thank you, Senator. Um, with, with those pieces from a policy end. How do we drive a new system that is more inclusive uh, that allows these pieces to all come together? And is today a better time? I mean, a lot of change going on in Washington starting in January. Um, does that change give us opportunity to look at things differently? Uh, how, how do you see that from a policy end? You know, I was uh, intrigued by your previous question, which was if we were building it from scratch, our rural health system, what would it look like? And I'll throw in a couple things that I, I would argue for. Not that we are building it from scratch. It's very hard to kind of uh, change a deeply embedded status quo. But one thing is I would have a universal health care system because think about how folks, uh, and we have a lot of folks on Medicaid in, in rural Oregon, and, but you're in a little bit more, more money, you're out of Medicaid. Now, how do you negotiate the uh, tax credits for middle-class uh, health? And then what if your job, you're getting healthcare through your job, but, but then your uh, employer says, we're not going to cover your kids. How do you get kids onto uh, the program for children's healthcare? And what if they say not covering your spouse? It's just a nightmare. I, so, uh, people get lost between the cracks, 
and they lose relationships as they move from from type of healthcare system to type of healthcare system. So, um, I, I a more uh, I guess you mentioned we the word integrated came up. Um, a system in which you never have to continuously do more paperwork to change systems. So um, I, I think it would be a very helpful for not losing people between the cracks. Uh, we did have the Medicaid expansion, so the Oregon Health Plan ex expansion. Uh, that is now a, a changing and we have um, uh, to requalify a ton of people. Just another example of, the, of all the bureaucratic uh, work that has to be done in our, our complex system. Second thing I would say is we'd have one electronic medical record system. Uh, countries that have one system, anywhere you go, your, your health care record pops up. And uh, I know in the medical care I've had, every place I go seems to have to start from scratch or try to get those records from some other system transported. It's a, that's a huge waste of time and energy. Um, but turning a, a little bit um, uh, to this question of how do you build this, the system, the office that I created, the Office of Rural Health at CDC, their big effort has been to put forward a rural public health strategic plan. So what is in that, that plan? And this is where uh, I really encourage um, uh, all of you as experts on Oregon rural health, if you don't like what's in that plan, they need to hear, there needs to be, they need to be consulting with rural healthcare providers around the country. And I assume that's what they've been doing. That was the whole purpose. But some of the things they have in their plan are prioritizing results-based engagement with rural communities. So let's, let's do the listening. Strengthening the rural health infrastructure and the rural health workforce, because that's obvious, but, but how? And so the detail, they have details in that plan. Advancing public health science for rural areas, recognizing that, that uh, rural health is different than urban health uh, challenges. And um, improving rural health preparedness and response capacity. So those are some of the things that are in this plan. I would love to have you all take a, a look at it and see what's of value, see what doesn't fit if you, as you were thinking about uh, what is going on in Oregon. And the, the last thing I would add is telehealth I hear about everywhere I go. It's just so important of a, of a tool. And there are some old embedded uh, rules that preceded COVID that are, are raising their head again, where there has to be in-person connection in ways that are much more difficult to accomplish in rural settings uh, because you don't have the specialist uh, there. And, and many folks on my, through my town halls have been telling me that they've gotten some excellent help uh, through telehealth, and that that's a really important tool. That also means you have to have rural broadband in order to uh, uh, accomplish that. So there's an act called Connect for Health Act that really is about uh, strengthening the uh, opportunity, particularly for telehealth in in a mental health uh, area. So that's a, a few thoughts. Great, thank you. Um, and of course, we'll be coming to you for a lot of money too, Senator. So just be prepared for that. That's my job, uh, provide money, what can you do it? <laughs> That's right, just print some more. Uh, so there are a few questions in the in the uh, chat that I wanna get to in some statements. And Jamie um, raised an issue about the mental health compact that Oregon is considering. And Jamie, I know that's not something that the Senator Merkley would deal with, but our, our local senators, and I'd be happy to follow up with you on that and continue some conversations because uh, there are compacts both on the mental health area, nursing and others that, that Oregon is looking at, I think could have a, a big impact on our ability to um, uh, increase access to care. Um, there, there's a comment from from uh, Rebecca about the policies written by academic and professional organizations creating downstream problems for rural hospitals to be able to meet standards that are based in high resource areas. Uh, and I think we see that when it comes to trying to, to, to put residency programs in uh, rural communities. I think we see that when we are developing public health programs that nobody in the rural areas can reach, et cetera. Um, and I and I think that puts some required that where we need to put some outside pressure on our academic institutions to focus on that. But it takes us to a workforce question. I'd love you all to to think about and give some feedback on, which is we really look now about using workforce incentives, trying to get our our workforce staffed up by people who are already professionals, already licensed or just about to. But we are missing the 
biggest part of the pipeline, which is K-12 education. And I'm wondering between, since again, all three of you have a slightly different perspective on this, how do you address the, the issue of pipelines from K-12? We need to be starting with third and fourth graders, not to tell them to be doctors, but to teach them about science and health and public health so that when they graduate from high school, we're ready to get them. How would you how would you propose or what do you see working um, that, that would allow us to do that better? And let's start with, um, with the folks down at Evergreen. You have comments? Okay, go ahead. No. Okay. Go well, first of all, I'm not an educator, so um, I, 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 I'm speaking out of my lane for sure. But I do have two children that have gone through the high school system. And I think uh, just strengthening our science programs. And I, I like the partnerships that the high school has had with our community colleges. We've had uh, some health professions courses, always introducing them to the possibility. What would it look like? Um, I, I think it's always a helpful step. Um, in, in terms of the actual curriculum, I and when to introduce that, I, I, I would begin to uh, answer uh, intelligently about that, but I think that um, it's a good start to introduce them uh, to the, what it looks like, what are the possibilities, where the innovations are in science, and they are, they are all in healthcare. A lot of things are going on in healthcare, but also how to make a difference. It's a, it's a very fulfilling um, profession, and so being able to communicate that message of purpose and uh, hope, I think, is it, it does have a positive impact. Yeah, I think the other way we influence that is through our school-based health uh, program and just kind of introducing the kids to what is possible and having our, we have a medical assistant in the schools um, every day who then, if a, if a child needs either medical help or um, mental health help, they telehealth back to the clinic and we always have someone that's able to help them. So just understanding uh, the whole medical process, because a lot of those kids never come in for a visit. Their parents don't bring them in for a visit. I think we're one of the worst uh, vaccination rate counties in Oregon, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, and those kids just don't show up. There's no way to get them in. So if we go out to them, I think that teaches them a little bit. And then the other thing is we're always open to have any of the high school kids come and shadow us um, and kind of see what that's all about if they have an interest in the medical field. Great, thank you. Michael from a public health. Yeah, this is, this could, could not be better teed up for me because this is where I, I've gone from a public health lens. When you look at uh, specifically in Jefferson County, uh, we're talking about retaining local talents locally to provide that health care. But only about 20% of the residents um, have some kind of secondary education. So you have immediately eliminated 80% of a possible work sort, work, workforce by having that focus on doctors and nurses and things like that. There are so many opportunities in, in, in healthcare and, and in public health. I, I often joke, whatever your interest, education, or, or, or a desire is, there's a job for you specifically tailored for your skill set in public health or, or in healthcare. So when we talk about developing and, and getting, getting youth involved, that's what I've kind of transitioned in, into now as my role with, with the, the local uh, Central Oregon Community College. That is my job now is, is to, to work upstream, to get in, in, get those students that are interested, not just they, they like healthcare, they have an idea of healthcare, but maybe all they know is when they go to see their doctor and nurse. They don't know the behind the scenes, everything from environmental health to electronic medical records to the front desk. These are rewarding careers that can have a drastic impact on the health of your community. We need to make sure that those individuals also have an opportunity uh, to, to help out and kind of eliminate that, that access issue. Great, thank you. Senator, what are you, from your perspective, have you seen at the federal levels programs that are supporting that pipeline in a way that you find effective from a funding source or different um, examples that you've seen? Well, one of the places where I heard a lot was, hey, we would love to hire more 
um, counselors for our schools, but we don't have people trained in, in mental health and counseling to fill those roles. And if you don't have the people, you can't hire them. Everybody's just trying to hire them away from each other. That's where a, so we, we were, we felt like there needed to be uh, more uh, training programs dedicated to this and University of Oregon has developed a program in, in partnership with the Balmer Institute. Their goal is to train 200 mental health uh, workers a, a, a year. So that type of effort using our universities and partners with foundations trying to say, hey, this is a beautiful thing, come and do this, this is needed. You'll have a, a good job, people are anxious to hire you. I think also I liked what was mentioned about the, the role of the, the high schools. Um, a while ago, we had a, a real effort in high schools to have a series of kind of vocational categories that students would do one thing or another or another. And one of those was a healthcare uh, track. So our students in high school got a lot of exposure to different types of healthcare uh, careers. And I think that fits right in with, with the discussion uh, about um, having an, that opportunity present in a, in a real way in our in our K-12 system. And I want our students in high school to realize that they can become a nurse in two years at a community college. My wife had a four-year degree in English. Uh, she then went to Mount Hood Community College and got a two-year uh, nursing degree. And that makes you an RN. You can be an LNN with um, a one-year uh, uh, program. And uh, she's had a marvelous uh, experiences in, in hospitals, in hospice, in homeless, uh, different types of, uh, from, from high pressure, uh, almost operation uh, factories uh, to very different uh, settings, coaching families in the final phase of, of life. So uh, that, that is an area where we just need to train a lot more and have those at our rural community colleges. Uh, because again, people who go through a program in a rural community college, they enter the workforce and stay stay in that part of the state. Great, thank you. I appreciate uh, Jasmine and Stephanie. They jumped in on the AHEC program. We have a great area health education center program in Oregon, um, and MedQuest and and the the program in St. Charles Center. I will say that program is zeroed out every year. Uh, and we usually have to fight to get the money back into the budget on that piece. And I think that uh, that may be a big challenge for us going into this next Congress as well. So um, as we talk about that, if there's any if, if any chance for your staff or anyone to, to visit the various AHACs, I'm ha happy to help set that up for some high school visits as well. Great. And I really encourage you all to connect with Becca on my team to help point out those sorts of opportunities where we can uh, where we can weigh in. I, I will say one of the things I'm worried about right now in terms of rural health care is that um, um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, is going to carry a portfolio of an anti-vax world. That is a challenge for, for public health. Uh, if you get a, you know, a certain percent of, of kids who don't have their measles vaccination, suddenly you have a, a real risk of it spreading and having a big impact. I don't know how to solve that. It's almost become a cultural uh, battle, but I think the people who are in the best position are for our folks who, who aren't, in, nobody wants to be lectured by anyone from DC or anyone from a city, but, but rural advocates for public health are in the best position to connect uh, and in, in a meaningful way with folks as they wrestle with the question of those sorts of uh, public health programs. Excellent, thank you. And, and on that note, the challenges. So, I mean, it's National Rural Health Day. We're only really supposed to be celebrating, right? But we can't celebrate without being realistic. And we know we have some challenges uh, out there facing rural public health. Um, Senator, from um, knowing what's gonna happen, in, well, not knowing what's gonna happen in the next Congress, um, what, what do you think the top couple challenges for rural health and rural health in Oregon are gonna be uh, and any thoughts about how we may address that? And then I'll check in with the other folks as well. You know, that's exactly the sort of question where I turn it around and, and ask for the experts from Oregon's rural communities to share their, uh, their what they see. I, you know, I hear a, a lot uh, about our, our, uh, our homeless community and the interconnection 
uh, with mental health in, in rural areas. Uh, a significant concern about the funding for programs, including public health in rural rural areas. Uh, there is um, uh, the uh, the head of uh, uh, Tesla has been uh, assigned to do uh, uh, cut a couple trillion dollars from the the budget. Um, I'm going to work like hell to prevent that from affecting programs like rural health, but but it isn't going to come out of the military. Uh, and so what is, are the recommendations of that panel going to be and what will gain traction? I think we're going to have to really, it's going to be a time we're going to have to really have advocates for rural health coming to tell the story of the programs that really matter so that we don't end up in a situation where those programs are devastated. Thank you. Um, how about um, Michael from a public health? What do you think the next the challenges for the next couple of years are going to be? Um, I, well, I touched on this at the Oregon Rural Health Conference, and I'm hoping that the new Oregon Health Authority Director, Dr. Naomi Biggs, will will help address that. I, I think I think we need to specifically recognize and call out that simply being rural in and of itself is an inequity and has a negative impact on potential health outcomes. We've heard, every, I mean, everyone on this call can start a presentation by saying. You know, rural, rural Oregon, older, sicker, poorer. So we need we need something to specifically call out that that rurality in and of itself. No matter what other disparities you may be experiencing, whatever whatever other inequities that you have uh, impacting your health, being rural will exponentially increase those. And so, if we can work with the Oregon Health Authority, the Public Health Advisory Board, the Health Equity Committee at the state level. To specifically call that out, I think that'll give us a, additional support and resources that we do need uh, when it comes time to to address some of these issues. Great, thank you. And Kim and Dr. Powell, I really don't have a lot to add uh, to that. I think that um, I I don't have a crystal ball. I, I I know what the concerns are. Um, I think there's just going to have to be consistent messaging uh, with the folks that we sit in the rooms with um, because uh, that's what I can impact. I can't impact funding. I can certainly give a message that I think is uh, the most uh, the most helpful to their health and hopefully I've developed a relationship that they they trust that. But um, no, I, I uh, obviously, I'm waiting to see with the rest of you what's going to happen for the next couple of years. Yeah, and I think uh, my feelings are uh, that I would like to be that we're still very siloed. We're, you know, in Roseburg, it's just the way it is, and it, we're siloed based on how the money's allocated uh, more so than anything. So everyone kind of hangs on to what they get as opposed to who's doing the work. So I would like, uh, you know, I'd like the Oregon Health Authority to um, also kind of take a look at how the Medicaid CCO system is working and, it, you know, if there's extra money in that, that it's uh, used appropriately um, for patient care. And and so I, I worry a little bit about that if they cut somewhere that it would may be in the wrong place. Um, and then I do worry that there might be more restrictions on rural health centers just because they don't understand exactly what we do. So I think with, uh, I'm with Dr. John with continuing to get that message out. We talked to HRSA, we talked to CMS, we continue to talk about the message of being able to take care of those uh, gaps of care and provide access and how important that is for our patients. Excellent, thank you, thank you. And I know that with all the things that are going on in, in DC, there's a lot gonna go on in, in Salem as well as we start our next legislative session with a new round of, of legislators there as well, which has been a lot of the conversation here at the State of Reform Conference in Portland. So. Um, there's a number of comments that have come up, and I really appreciate people adding the comments. Uh, Senator, I'll get some to your staff because there are a couple of folks are coming to DC. Uh, and so I'll make sure that they know who to get a hold of uh, in your office. Um, the comments on, on the importance of provider incentives, but trying to keep providers staying longer than just at the end of their, uh, their required two years. 
information that folks have added about um, uh, the AHEC programs. There's the one point about the public health programming for rural students, that the only programs offered are those that are sitting here in, in the Portland metro area or in the valley, and it's very difficult for students to be able to participate in those kind of programs that they have to come to this side. Um, I think that, uh, let's see, where else are we? There's a couple of comments from folks talking about the importance of that relationship in rural between pedi pediatricians and families to, again, get people focused on the importance of vaccinations and that it is about our kids and trust. It's not about a bigger, bigger message that goes on out there. So those are some of the comments that folks have had. And I don't know if anyone wants to add uh, any more in the last couple of minutes that we're here together. Um, but again, going back to National Rural Health Day, um, if you were going to be interviewed today by some, um, well, let's just say uh, some good podcaster or uh, or some uh, news anchor, and they're coming up and they're going to say, all right, uh, to celebrate National Rural Health Day, tell me the number one thing that makes you excited about rural health care. We'll start with Dr. Powell. Well, um, you know, I'm. First of all, uh, I get to make a difference. Uh, it is, um, it's, it's truly a privilege to do what I do. And um, actually, Dr. Merkley, you and I come from the same area. I grew up in Riddle Creek as well. So um, we, uh, what I do is I see the results of our efforts as a clinic to make a positive impact in the community. And um, not everyone, not every profession gets to see that. And uh, I'm just uh, elated that I get to do that. And I get to do that, that with colleagues that have the same purpose. And it's very fulfilling. Um, and uh, there's no question that the Rural Health Clinic Program has allowed us to, to, to grow our reach. And I appreciate that. Yeah, and I would just add to that. Um, just talking to patients, just being in the lobby and talking to patients who are so grateful to have access to care and access to classes and access to resource help and access to social determinants help, um, just how grateful they are just to be able to get health care um, and, and how grateful we are to provide that and be able to give that to them. Um, I think that is the most satisfying is just remembering we are all here to take care of our community and our patients. Thank you. Great. Michael. Uh, well, I, I think one thing to celebrate is the, the, the forward thinking of the state of Oregon uh, with things like the Medicaid uh, 115 waivers and things like that, and really looking at health related social needs and how your health is not directly tied to, to clinical care, that there are other, other ways that, that we can support and to have a mechanism and a funding stream built into that, um, I think is pretty exciting. Uh, and I, I think that's one thing that, that or I shouldn't say just one thing, that is one of the things that Oregon as a state is doing right when it comes time uh, to talk about rural health. Excellent, great. And Senator Merkley. I was just consulting with my, my team here because we were trying to uh, wrestle with the um, Medicaid changes and how they're going to impact rural Oregon. And there's, there's some real questions being raised about that. But in terms of uh, what I particularly get ex excited about, one is telehealth, the improvements, and then fighting to preserve those. A second is the FQHCs, uh, Federal Qualified Health Centers. I, I found that people love their, their health clinics, uh, FQHCs and, and others. Uh, as an approachable front door to a complicated medical world. And I think we need more of those, those health centers. And I wanna make sure also that certain important funding lines for rural health care, like the 340B program, uh, remains available. There's efforts by some very powerful uh, forces in the medical community to try to diminish that, that program that either those funds are either used, those discounts are either used to help keep clinics and hospitals open or their discounts uh, are, are passed on to patients to buy drugs. Uh, the, um, uh, so uh, that's, uh, I, 
I hope I hope we have cost effective uh, uh, the ability to maintain key key federal pieces that that maintain the flow of resources needed uh, for both the, the expansion of healthcare and the not just the the size of the clinics and the programs they have but the ability to hire uh, the personnel uh, to fill those positions. Can I just Great. throw in there the um... The 340B program is available to FQHCs and provider-based uh, RHCs, but we would love for it to be available to independent RHCs, which currently it is not. Uh, so, boy, if we're going to push on that, we would we would love to have that capability. Okay, that's great. That's great to know. Becca's making notes of that right now. And one of the threats that we see is some of the drug manufacturers are, are trying to deny 340B discounts to contract pharmacies. And a lot of hospitals and health centers in rural areas don't have their own pharmacies. They use contract pharmacies. So that's a threat we need to keep an eye on. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, though, Kim, because that is really important. Um, I want to thank all of you for being our guests today. Senator, there is one note on there. To, uh, thank you for support and, and pushing for our HR 7504, the Rural Veterans Transportation Care Act. So um, uh, we'll get you that note off to your staff as well. But want to thank uh, all of you, all four of you, for sharing your time today to celebrate National Rural Health Day and for your input. And we look forward to uh, more conversations and celebrating all things that are good in rural. So thanks Great. everybody and thanks Thank everybody you, Robert. for attending. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.